Welcome to the Science of Success with your host, Matt Bonner. Welcome to the Science of Success. I'm your host, Matt Bodner. I'm an entrepreneur and investor in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm obsessed with the mindset of success and the psychology of performance. I've read hundreds of books, conducted countless hours of research and study, and I'm going to take you on a journey into the human mind and what makes peak performers tick with a focus on always having our discussions rooted in psychological research and scientific fact, not opinion. In this episode, we examine how mindfulness practices developed independently in cultures across the globe, discuss how evolution shaped our brains to focus on survival instead of happiness and fulfillment. We ask, what is success? How do we define it? And what is the failure of success? We go deep into how to practice self-compassion and much more with Dr. Ronald Siegel. The Science of Success continues to grow with more than 925,000 downloads, listeners in over 100 countries, hitting number one new and noteworthy, and more. I get listener comments and emails asking me all the time, Matt, how do you organize and remember all this incredible information? A lot of our listeners are curious about how I keep track of all the incredible knowledge I get from reading hundreds of books, interviewing amazing experts, listening to awesome podcasts, and more. Because of that, we've created an epic resource just for you, a detailed guide called How to Organize and Remember Everything. And you can get it completely for free by texting the word SMARTER to the number 44222. Again, it's a guide we created called How to Organize and Remember Everything. All you have to do to get it is to text the word SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. Or go to scienceofsuccess.co, that's scienceofsuccess.co, and put in your email. In our previous episode, we discussed learning how to learn, meta-learning, how Salvador Dali and Thomas Edison practiced the art of sleeping without sleeping to hack their neural systems, the concept of chunking, what neuroscience says about it and how you can use it to become a learning machine, why following your passion is not the right thing to focus on, and much more with our guest, Barbara Oakley. If you want to become a learning master, listen to that episode. Today, we have another awesome guest on the show, Dr. Ronald D. Siegel. Ronald is the assistant clinical professor of psychology at the Harvard Medical School, where he's taught for over 30 years. He also currently serves on the board of directors and faculty of the Institute for Meditation and Psychotherapy. He's a longtime student of mindfulness meditation, having authored and co-authored several books on the topic, including The Mindfulness Solution, Mindfulness and Psychotherapy, and several more. Ron, welcome to the Science of Success. Thanks for having me. Well, we're very excited to have you on here. So for listeners who may not be familiar with you and some of your work, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm a clinical psychologist by training, and I happen to have been interested in mindfulness practices ever since I was a kid, and that I'm now in my uh, in my 60s, so that was uh, quite some time ago. And you know, I was doing them personally. And then about 35 years ago, I became involved with a group of people who were either training in or teaching in the Harvard Medical School system, all of whom were mental health professionals who all were also doing personal mindfulness practices. And back 35 years ago, we pretty much stayed under the radar and kept to ourselves because the mental health field was very heavily psychoanalytic at the time. And none of us wanted to be accused of having unresolved infantile longings to return to a state of oceanic oneness, which was how Freud understood meditation practices. So we stayed under the radar and we talked among ourselves. And then interestingly, over time, through the, the groundbreaking work of a number of innovators who brought mindfulness practices first into medicine and then into education and then into the mainstream more broadly, people became interested in what we knew about how mindfulness practices could help people with both everyday psychological difficulties difficulties, as well as more serious states of depression, anxiety, and the like. And so then we started writing and teaching for our colleagues, other professionals who are interested in this. And this has now mushroomed so that if you were to now go to, say, the annual meeting of what's called the uh, ABCT, which is the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, which is really where the scientifically minded people in the mental health field, not on the drug side, but the ones developing psychotherapies get together, the majority of presentations are now on mindfulness and acceptance-based treatment. So we now have this huge database showing that, gee, you know, mindfulness practices are enormously helpful for transforming people's lives. And so what I do nowadays is I still have a clinical practice. I'm I'm still a practicing psychologist, but I also go around the world training mostly mental health professionals in how to use these with their clients or patients, but also sharing this information with the general public. 
Before we dig too deep into mindfulness itself, I'd love to start our conversation with the idea that you've talked about in the past that we didn't evolve to be happy. It's interesting The mindfulness practices have been developed in virtually all the cultures of the world. And we wonder, well, how come? Why did this happen? And nowadays, modern psychology is very interested in what structures of the brain were originally evolved through Darwinian processes to be adaptive, in other words, to help us to survive and help us to reproduce and pass on our DNA, but perhaps we're not well equipped or or not uh, that perhaps don't incline us toward happiness. And I can just rattle off a few. One of them is our capacity to think. If you imagine our ancestor out there on the African savanna, hanging around with lions and other kinds of uh, predators around. And, you know, what did our ancestor, let's say Lucy, who is Australia Pithesis, one of our ancestors of of whom we have the bones, you know, what were her options for survival? If she came face to face with a lion, well, she could bare her teeth and show her claws, but uh, that wouldn't be terribly effective. She might try to run, but that wouldn't work. One of the first things you learn if you go on a walking safari in Africa is that everything out there that's scary is faster than you are. So the first thing the guides say is no matter what you encounter, please don't run. They say, you see that lumbering hippopotamus over there in the mud puddle? 42 miles an hour when he gets pissed. You see that half blind rhino behind the tree? 38 miles an hour. And in fact, if you run, they're just going to think that you're, and they're a predator, they're just going to think you're prey and they'll go after you all the more. So she wasn't going to be able to fight back. She wasn't going to be able to run away. She had a reasonable sense of hearing, a very limited sense of smell. Just ask your dog. Eyesight that was okay, not as good as an eagle or a giraffe, but better than the half blind rhino. And somehow she survived. Well, we know she had several things going for her. One was a prehensile thumb, and that's the ability to grasp things and pick up things and make tools. And if you just compare your dexterity to say your dog's dexterity, it's clear that that helps a lot. The other thing we had was the fight or flight response, which allows us to mobilize a lot of energy in an emergency situation. And the third thing we had was this capacity to think. Now the prehensile thumb doesn't cause us a lot of trouble as humans, but boy, oh boy, does this fight or flight system, especially tied to this capacity to think, make us miserable. We know the activation of the fight or flight system because we experience it most often as either excitement or anxiety. And very often it's tied to worry. And thinking gets us into trouble in large part because our thinking capacity is not some neutral computer. Lucy was able to survive out there in the savannah because she was able to remember past events and anticipate future ones and strategize as to how to survive the future challenge. But her mind wasn't some neutral computer, as I said. It was, as I have a friend, Rick Hansen, who wrote a wonderful book called The Buddha's Brain, in which he says that our mind evolved with a negativity bias that makes it like Velcro for bad events and Teflon for good ones. So when bad events happen, they stick. When good ones happen, they slide right off the pan. And this makes perfect sense. If you could imagine Lucy out there on the savanna, she could have made one of two types of errors. And we can call it a type one error and a type two error, roughly if any of you are trained in science, the way we use those terms in scientific research. She could have been looking at, let's say, a set of bushes that had a vague bay shape behind it. And she could have thought, oh my God, it's a lion when it was really just a beige rock. And that would have been a type one error. Or she could have thought, eh, it's probably a beige rock when it was really a lion. That would be a type two error. And if you think about it, Lucy could have made countless type one errors and still lived for another day and passed on her DNA and and the like. But if she made even one type two error, even one time mistaking thinking that the lion were just a rock, that's the end of her DNA line. So we develop brains that are exquisitely sensitive to danger, that remember every bad thing that happened. And we see this in everyday worries, we see this in everyday preoccupations, And we might imagine that back in Lucy's day, there were some happy hominids hanging around, holding hands, singing kumbaya, remembering the last dynamite sexual experience or luscious piece of fruit. 
They typically, however, were not our ancestors. Why? Because they died before they got to reproduce. Our ancestors were the ones who were going around saying, oh my God, looks like a lion. Damn, could be a snake. Shit, is that a cliff? Et cetera. So we developed this brain that is constantly anticipating danger and remembering bad things that happen that is tied to this fight or flight system where we feel our you know, palm sweating, our heart racing, all the different things that happen to us. And whether it's you know, asking somebody out on a date that we're afraid won't like us, going to the job interview, thinking about what's gonna happen to my finances, you know, worrying about our health and on, worrying about what other people think of us and on and on and on, we actually evolved to be tormented in this way. And uh, interestingly, some people, when they hear this, they say, well, 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 but I've heard that, you know, stress is really bad for your health. So that doesn't really make sense that we would have been evolved. We would have evolved to be such stressed out beings. But if you think about it, most of the stress related disorders, you know, everything from chronic headaches and stomach aches and the like to things like heart attacks, they typically don't kill us until after we've reproduced. So the fact that we live a life stressed out and tormented in one way or another actually had very little effect, very little negative effect on our capacity to reproduce. So natural selection didn't really care about it so much. So that in a nutshell is what we mean by we didn't evolve to be happy. Such an important concept for people to understand that our, our brains were literally sculpted by evolution to focus on the negative, to focus on fears and threats and anything that might bring us perceived harm. Exactly. And and just to add one other thing, you know, the other thing that they they were the other form of harm that causes tremendous suffering for us today is our concern with social ranking. You know, humans hung out in primate troops of 25 to 50, and you were with the same group of 25 to 50 from birth until death. You know, new new members were being born and dying, but it was a pretty small club. And if we look at other primates that are organized that way, chimpanzees and others, we see that they spend a lot of their energy jockeying for dominance, you know, trying to figure out who's the alpha male, who's friends with the alpha male, who's supported by the alpha male, which females are going to be sexual partners to the more dominant males and the like. And there's actually a fair amount of tension that goes into this. And it doesn't take a lot of observation looking at human beings to notice that, oh my, we spend a lot of our energies jockeying for position. And the way this shows up in most of us in terms of our subjective experience is concerns about self-esteem. You know, what do people think about me? How am I doing compared to the other guys or the other, uh, the other women? And we get hooked on an extraordinary variety of different dimensions or domains. You know, for one person, it's, well, in our society, you know, who has more money, right? For someone else, it's who has the higher position in the organization. For somebody else, it's who has more friends. For someone else, it's who's morally purer or more righteous. For somebody else, it's who's more artistically creative. For lots of people, it's who's better looking, who's more buff, who has the better body. And this goes you know, who has the sexier spouse or girlfriend or boyfriend. And for older folks, you know, who has the better behaved or higher achieving kids. And this goes on and on and on the ways in which we're constantly comparing ourselves to one another. <clears throat> you know, if, if if our listeners would reflect on this for a moment on the kind of comparisons that you make, and uh, we all make them, even though we tend to be embarrassed about making them and we tend to uh, keep our thoughts to ourselves, you know, who among us always wins, right? You know, we're always going up and down in these comparisons. I remember once I asked a, uh, a group of therapists about that and a guy raised his hand when I said, you know, who among you always wins? And I thought, you know, avoid him at lunch, right? Because the people who think they're always winning are kind of insufferable. So we have this other dimension of social comparison and worrying about whether we're good enough, which is also quite hardwired. And the way that that got hardwired is because it turns out that the higher ranking males got to reproduce more with the more reproductively promising or fertile females translate, you know, the, the guys who were on top in the pack got the hot babes, right? That's more or less how this translates. And they actually got to pass their DNA 
down more. So here too, we could imagine that there might have been happy hominids hanging around, not caring about that, you know, being egalitarian, just connecting out of love. But by and large, they didn't get to reproduce as much. So we didn't get so many of their genes. It's not that we don't have some of those genes, but we've got an awfully strong genetic loading to worry about who we are, how we compare to others. And this stuff causes, well, I mean, it runs the whole advertising business. It 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 drives most people's achievement motivation. It really does a lot of running the world if we step back and reflect on it. And it doesn't do it happily because we can never win consistently. And unless you live in Lake Wobegon where, you know, all of the women are strong, the men are good looking, and all of the children are above average, you know, you're, you're always going to be above average and below average some of the time. And also we change our comparison group so that if you're an Olympic athlete, your comparison group is the other guys going for the, you know, the bronze, the silver and the gold. You're not thinking anymore. Well, you know, I'm a better athlete than the other kids in high school. That's no longer relevant. So we continue to recalibrate and that adds to our, our difficulties as well. And that speaks to something you've talked about in the past, which is the, the concept of the pain of I, me, my, mine. Is that the same concept or are, the, are those sort of interrelated? Yeah, absolutely. The and, and there are a number of dimensions to this. One of the ways in which, you know, constant preoccupation with ourselves causes a lot of pain is simply this this kind of social comparison and the the utter impossibility of winning or staying on top consistently. Another way in which that plays out is when we're preoccupied with trying to prove ourselves in some way, it tends to disconnect us from other people. And one of the other things that we are actually hardwired for is to feel connected to the rest of the primate troop. If you can imagine, again, going back to the African savanna, if somebody were kicked out of the troop and were there on their own, their chances of survival would be quite minimal. So we have this really hardwired instinct to want to be accepted by and connected with the group. And in fact, when we feel connected to a group of friends or family, it feels really good to us. But this runs counter to this other impulse toward, you know, becoming the uh, the winner, which tends to cut us off from people and cause a lot of suffering. And unfortunately, you know, most cultural forces, particularly in Western free market economies nowadays, you know, you don't get a lot of messages of, you know, how can we support one another? You get a lot of messages. How can you achieve and come out on top? And I, I might even say, you know, for the the title of your series, which deals with success, it's a very and, and I don't know how many of your speakers have been addressing this, but you know, what do we mean by success? Do we mean by success coming out on top, you know, having, you know, the most in terms of these social comparisons, or we mean by success, no longer feeling like we need to pursue that? Because either way, and I would argue the latter way, you're going to wind up a good deal happier than if you put all your eggs in the basket of beating the other guy or the other woman. And that ties into another concept you've talked about, which is the failure of success and how we constantly kind of recalibrate. Uh, I'd be curious to to hear you explain that. Well, that's that's what I was mentioning vis-a-vis -vis the Olympic athletes, but we don't even need to look at them. We can look at you know, just our own lives and think of how many moments we had in our lives in which we thought, wow, when I reach that threshold, when I reach that milestone, I'm going to feel good about myself and I'm going to feel like I had arrived. And, you know, this starts very early in the kid feeling like, oh, I really want to stand up and walk. And indeed, they do feel good when they can stand up and walk for a while or when I can ride a bicycle or when I can go to the store by myself or when I graduate elementary school or junior high or high school or get my first girlfriend or boyfriend or get a driver's license or or get a car or get a house or get a well-paying job or whatever it is. You know, I train a lot of mental health professionals and most of us work very hard to get a professional degree at some point. You know, for many of us, it was a, you know, six year or so post baccalaureate process. So after college, another six years or so for most people to get, say, a doctorate in psychology or uh, roughly similar to become a psychiatrist, for example. And, you know, while we were going through those processes, you know, wow, the thought of, wow, when I finally get there, when I'm finally, you know, degreed and licensed, that's going to feel good. And indeed, when we reach the milestone, it does feel good. But I'll often ask the audience of, 
mental health professionals, many of whom are quite senior. How many of you woke up this morning feeling, I feel so fulfilled because I have my professional degree and license? And of course, everybody cracks up laughing because everybody's habituated to it. It's like, oh, yeah, that, of course, that. But I feel good or bad, depending on what happens to me today. You know, am I are more people interested in my work? Am I getting, you know, praise from the people who I'm working with? Am I being invited to be part of this or that professional organization? We we constantly recalibrate and then need more and more and more if we're predicating our sense of well-being on achievement. So how does that tie into some of the common misconceptions that people have about what they think will make them happy? Well, you know, the misconceptions we have about happiness are very similar to addictions generally. What happens when we're addicted to something and, you know, let's take and let's take addictions that don't have a particularly strong, wholesome aspect to them, like addiction to alcohol or, you know, eating too much chocolate cake or, well, addiction to anger is a little complicated, but, but you know, some kind of unwholesome habit, right, that, that we find ourselves doing. In the short run, it feels very good. You know, to go from not drinking to drinking, if you're feeling anxious or upset or stressed out, feels really good. And of course, and I'm not knocking alcohol, if you do that occasionally and in in moderation, it's fine. But if you do it too much and you always go for it to get rid of some kind of pain and to feel better, we know that in the long run, it feels quite bad. We do not get happy doing that. And the same is true for almost all of the unhealthy things that, you know, that, that we do because they feel good in the short run, but bad in the long run. When we have a self-esteem victory, you know, when we beat the other guy or the other woman or they cho- or we were the chosen one or we got to feel, hey, I'm, I'm really good at this. In the short run, it feels very good. We have that feeling of that uplifting feeling in our chest, the sense of buoyancy, feeling taller, feeling bigger, thinking, oh, people will respect me now or like me now. You know, there's all this good feeling that goes with that. But the problem is, if we attach to it, we become addicted to that feeling. And then trying to reproduce it makes us quite unhappy in the long run. So as it turns out, what makes people far happier in the long run is finding ways to connect safely to others and to engage more fully in whatever they're doing in this moment, whether the thing we're doing in this moment seems something grand or special or seems quite ordinary. And that's actually where mindfulness practices come in as an antidote to these hardwired propensities toward toward suffering. So let's transition the conversation now and really dig into the concept of mindfulness. People, people use that word a lot and they, and they sometimes use it interchangeably with phrases like meditation. They sometimes use it incorrectly. Really simply, what is mindfulness and how do you define it? So mindfulness is actually an attitude that we can have toward whatever we're experiencing in a particular moment. So it's not exactly a state of mind, it's not about being calm, but it is about being aware of your present experience, whatever's happening right now, and being able to accept or embrace whatever's happening right now. So, you know, because mindfulness practices are now being used so widely in psychotherapy, there have been a number of scales developed to measure mindfulness. And it turns out that if you ask people, are you aware of your present experience with acceptance? You run into this problem. It's uh, it's actually called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And a couple of psychologists at Cornell, I think they won a Nobel Prize for discovering this. And this has to do with the fact that across all sorts of human activities, our actual competence is inversely proportional to our perceived competence. So actual competence is inversely proportional to perceived competence. What that means is we can think of this as the Homer Simpson effect. Homer is supremely confident when he goes out on his misadventures. It's just us in the audience thinking, doesn't look good, (laughs) you know? People who think they're great at stuff typically aren't. People who have doubts typically are more skilled. So what we see in terms of mindfulness is people who have spent years doing mindfulness practices, which are designed to cultivate mindfulness. If you ask them, are you aware of your present experience with acceptance? They say, well, 
it's a rare event. Sometimes I'm really present. But if you ask people who haven't been practicing, they'll say, oh yeah, I'm aware all the time. Because one of the things that happens as we develop mindfulness is we develop what at Google they're now calling higher resolution consciousness. Think of it as more pixels per square centimeter, if you will. You develop the capacity to really notice what's going on in the mind moment by moment. And what we find when we notice that, when we develop that capacity, is we find that most of the time, our minds are lost in the thought stream. We're thinking about the future, thinking about the past, and trying to strategize or angle how to get more pleasure, more pleasure, more pleasure in the future, and avoid pain and discomfort in the future. And what we start to realize when we take up mindfulness practices is that there's an alternative, that instead of being lost in the thought stream, we can actually bring our attention moment to moment to what's happening in the mind or the body. And as a result, most mindfulness practices, things that are designed to develop mindfulness, to develop this attitude toward experience, involve picking a sensory object, something in the present moment, a sensation like the sensation of the breath in the body or like sounds or like colors or like taste, but something that's a sensory experience and following that as closely as possible with our attention. And every time the mind leaves it and leaps off into the thought stream, gently bringing it back to this object of awareness. And when we do this enough, what happens is we actually begin to disconnect somewhat from our thoughts. Thoughts still arise and pass the way they normally do, but instead of believing in each thought as being reality, like if I'm thinking, hey, I'm doing a good job on this interview and thinking of that as real, or I'm doing a terrible job on this interview and think of that as reality, instead I just start to notice, oh, there's another self-evaluative thought popping up. And we start to see thoughts much more like clouds passing through a sky. We simply don't identify with them or believe in them as much. And that starts to become enormously useful because that starts to disconnect us or free us from this hardwired negativity bias around thinking that I spoke about earlier. Just to pursue mindfulness and thought here for a moment, and then I'll get back to your question about meditation. I invite you and people in the audience to think about something that's upsetting. Okay, just bring that to mind. And then reflect for a moment, would I be upset about this if it weren't for simply my thought about it? Because when we think about things that are upsetting, they're typically not what I'm tasting now, what I'm touching now, what I'm feeling in my body now. They're typically anticipations of what might happen or what is happening somewhere else. So we start to notice that a huge amount of our, our psychological suffering has to do with our thinking. And if we can begin to get perspective on our thinking by doing mindfulness practices in which we simply notice thoughts as arising and passing as mental contents rather than realities, that can be enormously freeing to us. Now, there, there was a wonderful study that was done actually at Harvard by a graduate student here named Matthew Killingsworth. And he developed a smartphone app which paged people at random intervals during the day and asked them to report on three things, what they were doing, where their attention was at that moment, and how they were feeling. And he discovered that, first of all, he discovered that people's minds, he said, were wandering 47 odd percent of the time. I think that's a grossly low estimate. If you take up mindfulness practices, you'll begin to notice that your mind is wandering 95 plus percent of the time. So there was that. But the next thing he discovered was what predicted whether people felt a sense of well-being or not had little to do with what they're actually doing. The main variable was whether they were paying attention to what they were doing while they were doing it. So to use a, an extreme example, participants who were making love or eating a gourmet meal, but whose minds were wandering, felt less well-being than people who were washing the dishes, but were fully present to the experience of washing the dishes, feeling the soap, feeling the water, noticing the colors, looking at the bubbles, like that. Because it turns out that as human beings, when we can be engaged in the present moment, that almost always brings a sense of well-being. And when we're fantasizing about the future, thinking about the past, and trying to angle for how to rack up more pleasure, more status, more of stuff that we think will make us happy, we're actually, we actually have a great deal less well-being. So just to circle around to something I neglected that you mentioned, you said, so how's mindfulness related to meditation? These are overlapping ideas. Meditation is 
describes a whole set of different kinds of practices that we might do to cultivate certain states of mind. For example, there's Christian contemplative meditation, just as an example, where people meditate on passages of the Bible to see what relevance they might have or what teaching they might have to offer for how to live a life well. That's one form of meditation. Mindfulness meditation is a different form of meditation, and mindfulness meditation has sort of two components, not to get too technical about this, but one of them is developing concentration, developing the ability to have this higher resolution consciousness, which we develop by simply practicing again and again, bringing our attention back to a sensory object in the present and really attending to it carefully. And the other component that it, another component that it has is now called by neurobiologists open monitoring, which is once we develop a certain amount of t attention, then we can kind of open the field of awareness to notice wherever the mind goes in each moment, but we're aware that the mind is jumping around to different objects. So in open monitoring, I might be starting to pay attention to my breath, but then I hear the birds sing, and then I notice the itch on my left thigh, and then I notice a thought coming about what I'm going to do next, and we sort of follow these different things out. And this it may be a little technical for people who are just beginning, but the upshot of this is we learn how to train the mind to be aware of what's happening and to be able to be accepting of it and to not be pushing away the unpleasant experiences and grasping at the pleasant ones. And it is that skill when we learn to actually accept what's going on moment to moment that really shifts us away from all of the hardwired propensities towards suffering to living a life that feels much fuller, much richer, in which we're really engaged moment to moment in what's happening, but we're not striving so much. One of the things, and, and I've, I've practiced meditation regularly for about three years, one of the things that it's, it's helped me with tremendously is cultivating that awareness of my thoughts. But I've struggled more with, with the acceptance component. How can you really cultivate and train and build that that acceptance muscle. Yeah, well, there are a number of exercises that are actually explicitly designed to do this that various mindfulness traditions have. There, uh, there are practices that are called loving kindness practices, for example, that come out of Buddhist traditions in which a person first visualizes somebody who is naturally loving and kind and then begins to try to generate in the heart. This is sometimes actually done with a hand over the heart or two hands over the heart and try to generate loving and kind wishes for that person, as you might for a puppy or a child you loved and the like. And then once you've got a little bit of that going and begin to feel those feelings, actually generate the loving kindness feeling toward oneself. Because a lot of times if the thing that's arising in the mind, if the mental content is painful, let's say it's a feeling of shame or a feeling of failure or concern about rejection or worry about our health or on and on and on, the different things that can that are painful to us, one of the ways that we can learn to accept it is by developing capac the capacity to soothe ourselves. You know, just as if a kid gets hurt and a caring adult comes and scoops them up in their arms and, you know, says, oh, it'll be okay, sweetheart. Simply being held in that way makes it much easier for the child to bear the pain. In a similar kind of way, we can make it easier for us to bear the pain by learning how to be loving toward ourselves this way. And so there's a whole array of what are called loving kindness practices or self-compassion practices, which fall under the umbrella of mindfulness practices, which help us to self-soothe and help us with the acceptance part. Because basically human beings can accept an awful lot if we feel loved if we feel safe. And we have difficulty accepting things when we feel like, oh, you know, we're going to be rejected for it and we feel all alone with it. And, you know, this applies to, let's take something that happens all the time where we feel rejected or slighted in some way in a relationship. Maybe it's a love relationship that, that isn't working out as we want to, or a relationship at work where our peers or our, or our superior, you know, isn't looking, is looking at us with shining eyes. And, you know, it's always very painful to us, but if we can feel loved and held like by a good friend or, or a parent or a lover and be able to feel that feeling of disappointment, we find that it's it's much easier to bear it and that if we open to it, 
it passes and transforms by itself. And in fact, sometimes we we learn things from it. So so those kinds of practices can help with the acceptance dimension of mindfulness. We also talked about, and you did a great job explaining how social rankings and, and how we get caught in these cycles of comparison. How does mindfulness help us uh, break out of those cycles? Well, it helps in a number of ways. One way is simply to notice how often it occurs. We can all do an exercise together right now that I've been experimenting with. Think for a moment of some thing or some attribute that you've got, some quality that you kind of rely on for your self-esteem. Maybe it's that you're smart or you're athletic or you have friends or you're well-liked or you're creative or you're a good writer or could be any, anything. Okay. We all have them, but just think of something that kind of makes you feel good about yourself. And then remember the last time that you got some feedback whether from others or from yourself, that validated it, that made you think, yeah, I really am smart. Yeah, I really am a cool dude. Yeah, I, I really am lovable. Or yeah, I really you know, do a good job at my work or whatever it might be. And just, just tune in for a moment of how it feels in your body to remember, or if you can't remember it's time, just imagine it happening now, this feeling of success or validation. If you don't mind my asking, Matt, can you describe how you feel it? where it is is a bodily sensation? I would say it's like a calmness in my upper body and maybe like a, like a, like a sort of a tingling energy in kind of my lower torso. Okay, cool. And for me, it's a kind of uplifting of the chest a little bit. I feel a little kind of taller or so when it happens. And now imagine for a moment or recall a time where the opposite happened, where, you know, Either you got rejected or you felt you failed or you got feedback that you weren't so good at something or you tried something and you gave yourself feedback that you weren't so good at it and it felt like a dejected moment. And can you describe how that feels in the body? I'd say it's like a tightness in my chest and sort of a, 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 like, a ra- like a racing feeling up my, the back and bottom of my spine kind of. Okay, cool. And for me, it's a it's a little bit of a sinking feeling in my stomach and my shoulders kind of roll forward. And it may be different for, for our, our, our listeners. Everybody's different around this. So just identifying those feeling states in the body. One of the things you can do with mindfulness practice is as we're staying as much as possible moment by moment with noticing what's happening in the mind and in the body during the day, notice each time that we get one of the inflation feelings and each time we get one of the deflation feelings. Now, this can be a little horrifying because many of us start to notice, oh my God, it's happening all day long, virtually every conversation, you know, either comparing myself with somebody or thinking, oh, this is going well and they like me or this isn't going so well. Or, you know, we, there's a lot of these ups and downs that are happening. You know, I, I know, you know, not to put you on the spot, but it, we, you know, it, it had some technical difficulties, right? Getting started. I'm imagining that during those few minutes where you were, you know, trying to get the computer to work, you know, there's a lot of this, you know, both anxious and not feeling so good about myself feelings, right? Going on. And Definitely. then, you know, you, then you, it gets rolling and you start saying, oh, it's okay. You know, I'm in the saddle again. I'm doing all right. And, you know, so I, I'm just using that as an example because it just happened between the two of us. But these things are happening all day long for all of us. As we become more mindful, we start to notice, oh, gosh, yeah, the ups and downs, the ups and downs, the ups and downs. Look at this. And the more we see it, the less seriously we start to take it. You know, in, instead of putting all of our energy into how can I arrange it so I always come out a winner, we start to instead put our energy into just watching these cycles of winning and losing so that we learn to not take them so seriously. And the other thing that we do is, with mindfulness practices, and this is more the self-compassion part of it or the loving kindness part of it, is when we are hurting, when we notice that you know we've had a disappointment, we've had a failure, something hasn't turned out well, which it inevitably will, inevitably we'll have these moments of of defeat that we can just kind of be nice to ourselves and you know give ourselves a hug feel the feeling of vulnerability feel the feeling of failure and trust that that's okay too that it's just part of the cycle and we don't have to identify with that or believe in it because as it turns out none of us are so great and none of us are so terrible and you know 
I know a lot of your audience is on the younger side, so you may not think too much about this, but you know, the life cycle is a pretty brief trip. A friend of mine gave me this example and try this on. Do you know who the King of England was in uh, 1361? Do you happen to know? No idea. Yeah. I don't either, but I can promise you in 1361, he was a big deal in England and a lot of people knew. So, you know, whatever all of our success and failures are, they're all going to be pretty irrelevant not too long from now. And, you know, I may be more acutely aware of that than your younger listeners because I'm in my 60s, but it doesn't take long before before we start to notice that it, it is really all a passing show and all of this energy that we put into, you know, trying to win at the game winds up. Seeming a little silly at a certain point. And this is not to say, by the way, let, let me just make really clear that it's not a good idea to put your heart and energy into uh, some project that you're interested in or some achievement you want to make have or getting an advanced degree or the like. This is only to say that doing those things with the fantasy that they're going to allow us to then always feel like a winner. That's the mistaken one, because that's what doesn't work out. It's if we're engaged in it in a wholehearted way and we're using our our talents, our energies and the like, you know, that's wonderful. That's not that's not subject to, you know, narcissistic recalibration or what's called the hedonic treadmill. These things in which we need more and more of them just to stay in the same place because engagement like that, that can sustain us throughout a life. But if but the social comparison stuff we can't win at in any kind of sustained way. It's a great example, and and I, I smiled to myself when you when you kind of use that example, the King of England in 1361. It just shows that it helps us in some ways, sort of untether our our self worth and our daily experience from these achievements that seem so so important and so relevant in the moment. But in reality, it's all kind of every, everything is going to pass away eventually. And that is one of the other insights that comes from mindfulness practice, that when we take up these practices, we start to notice that all consciousness is this stream of experience and that the that, you know, whatever our experience was, even your your and my experience and the listener's experience from five minutes ago, that's already gone. That's gone over the waterfall of experience. Well, I know you have, uh, I know you have to go shortly. What is one kind of small piece of homework or a starting place that you would give listeners who want to really dive into mindfulness? Well, there are a number of resources. I mean, one, it's usually best to take up a mindfulness practice with a guided meditation. And I happen to have some that are available for free on the web if anybody wants to check them out. They're at a website, which is called mindfulness-solution.com. So mindfulness-solution.com. If you go to the download meditations, you can stream them or download them and you can take up the practices. And there's also a book that I wrote for general audiences called The Mindfulness Solution, Everyday Practices for Everyday Problems. And that gives you kind of detailed instructions and it's actually linked to the downloadable meditations. And that's a uh, uh, inexpensive paperback that's easy to get. So that's one way to start. I mean, there are many other people who've done this as well. You don't have to start with my resources, but it's, it's usually best to start doing mindfulness practices, which are times where we take some time out of our day to deliberately cultivate this awareness of present experience with acceptance. And then once we've taken some times out to do to do it the same way, if you want to become physically fit, you could go to the gym for a little bit every day or every other day, and you develop some physical fitness. And then during the intervening times, you might decide to take the stairs instead of the elevator or uh, perhaps walk somewhere instead of getting on the bus or going in the car. In the same way, there are informal mindfulness practices that we can do in between our meditation sessions that help to bring us mind, our mind into the present, help us to attune to sensory reality, and help us to become less caught in believing in our thoughts. And those are all outlined in the Mindfulness Solution book. And where can people find you in the book online? Mindfulness-solution.com. And we'll make sure to include that in the show notes. Just go to scienceofsuccess.co and click the show notes button at the top. You can get all of that stuff. Well, Ron, thank you so much for being on the show. This was an amazing conversation. I know I learned a tremendous amount and it's been an honor to have you as a guest. Thanks so much for having me. 
Thank you so much for listening to the Science of Success. Listeners like you are why we do this podcast. The emails and stories we receive from listeners around the globe bring us joy and fuel our mission to unleash human potential. I love hearing from listeners. If you want to reach out, share your story, or just say hi, be sure to shoot me an email. My email is matt at scienceofsuccess.co. That's M-A-T-T at scienceofsuccess.co. I'd love to hear from you, and I read and respond to every listener email. The greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to a friend either live or online. If you've enjoyed this episode, please leave us an awesome review and subscribe on iTunes because that helps more and more people discover the science of success. I get a ton of listeners asking, Matt, how do you organize and remember all this information? Because of that, we've created an amazing free guide for all of our listeners. You can get it by texting the word SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. Or by going to scienceofsuccess.co, that's scienceofsuccess.co, and joining our email list. If you want to get all this incredible information, links, transcripts, everything we've talked about, and much more, be sure to check out our show notes. Just go to scienceofsuccess.co, hit the show notes button at the top. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Science of Success. 